Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Can you hear me? Yes. Maybe. Maybe not. Let me check my connection here. Oh, there we go. Now we can hear me. Glad everybody made it for worship this morning. I hope you're doing well. Everybody doing well? Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Everybody doing well? All right, there we go. Just want to bring and highlight some announcements to you this morning. First off, you'll find in your bulletin the Easter lily form. We have another week or two before these are due. So if you want to order a lily for Easter, make sure you fill out the back part of it, and you can put that in the offering plate as it comes around later this morning, along with your request for that. A couple of things going on at the church this week. I want to remind everybody the Lenten lunch is here this week for the community. Uh, it's going to be on Wednesday, beginning at 1130. I've been asked to tell all the ladies who are bringing salads, have them here by 9 a.m. I know it's early, but have them here by 9 a.m. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> uh, also want to remind you, uh, coming up, uh, we've got other activities, including UMW. Uh, also, it's not too late to help support Veronica and getting her parents here. Uh, you can still make a contribution. I think they've arranged the flights and everything. So if you'd like to help out with that, please do so by putting a check in the offering plate and make sure you put Mar Veronica Mission Fund on it. So I want to make sure you do that. And we've got something special coming up Easter. Uh, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt, pseudo kind of part of worship. As we close worship on that, the kids are going to get a chance to uh, hunt Easter eggs. We'll have more on that as Easter gets closer this morning. But as we get closer to our worship time and closer to us becoming closer with God, as we take the business of the world and put it all away from us and put it beside us, focusing only on Him this morning, as we prepare for worship, let us do so with song. Good morning. If everyone will please stand and join me in singing our hymn of praise, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Let us join together in our call to worship. Bless God at all times. May praise of God be always in your mouth. Our souls make their boast to God, the afflicted here in our life. O oh, magnify our God with me, and let us extol God's name together. We sought our God. Look to God and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. 
Let us take a moment now to greet one another with signs of love and peace. seats we're going to do our songs of praise and worship
So I'm sure you've heard of my brother, the prodigal son, the one who, who practically stole his inheritance by asking my father for it before he was dead. I mean, who does that? And he took the money so that he could go and live like a rock star. Parties, booze, women, drugs, all while living under our family's good name. He never even contacted us. After a while, we began to think he never would. And then tonight, on my way home from work, there are cars parked everywhere, and I can't manage to get a spot. I have to park all the way away from the house, and I get out of the car, and I start walking toward the house, and one of my neighbors comes out. My neighbor walks up to me. He's ecstatic. He's, he's stumbling over words, and finally he gets out. Your brother is home. Really? No, not my brother, my father's son. And apparently he told my father some sob story about how after the money was all gone, he began to feel very sorry for what he had done. Kind of convenient, don't you think? My father bought it. He, he took the bait and decided to throw a party for this con artist of a son. After all that he had done, he tells one little story and he's back in the family as if nothing had ever happened. Well, I'm not going in. I'm not going to the party. I, I, I'm not going to believe what everybody inside there believes. People don't change like that. And so I, I turned around and I started to walk back toward my car. Evidently, my father was watching. He came running out of the house and he came up to me and he started begging me to come inside. He started begging me to come to the party. Well, I'd had enough of this idiocy. And so I turned around and I shouted right in his face, look, all this time I've been with you, I've been slaving for you, and I've never once disobeyed you. And this son of yours, who's wasted all your wealth, comes home and you throw a party for him. But when I was looking at his face, I noticed that it had changed. And I noticed that all the frustration that I had seen in him was gone. And he just looked at me, and he, and he lovingly said, my son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had to have a party because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. But I say, and after all that he's put us through, let him stay dead. My father acted as if the money didn't matter. He acted as if, as if nothing mattered. Nothing that my brother did or said, nothing that he acted as or posed as mattered at all. He was simply overjoyed to have him home. But doesn't it matter? Doesn't everything that he did matter? I think it does. And if I go into that party, I'll be acting like nothing ever happened. But it did. So, doesn't it matter? Next part of our service is a chance for us to uh, lay everything before God in prayer. You'll find on the back of your bulletin our prayer concerns as we have listed. Don't forget you can always... Fill out one on the back of your bulletin after service. 
put it in the offering plate, and we'll get it up on the board, and we'll get it on the list as well. You can also use the app or website to submit your prayer requests as well. With an attitude of prayer, let's go to God this morning. Lord, this morning we come to you. Lord, we give thanks to you. Lord, you gave us life. You created the heavens and earth. You created Adam and Eve. You made them in your own image. You even sent your Son to the earth to teach us your ways and to save us from our sins. Lord, you're present with us each and every day, even though we might not realize it. Lord, for all that, we give you thanks and praise this morning. We praise your glorious name. We seek to be with you as this morning we come together. Your body in Christ to sing praises, to worship. Lord, help us to remember that at all times and all places that you're always available to us. From the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we fall asleep, Lord, we know you're with us always. This morning, Lord, we come to you not only to give you thanks, but to also bear our issues, things that weigh us down, that keep us separated from you, or that we feel are separating us from you. Lord, the times we feel like our issues are much too trivial for us to bring them to you. But you've told us time and time again that there's nothing too small or nothing too big that you can't handle or you don't want to take from us. You want it. You want us to, to, to say and speak those things that are troubling us. Lord, you know our thoughts and prayers before we even speak them, Lord. But through your teachings... You tell us, speak them, lay them out to you, share them with you. Lord, this morning we lift up our brothers and sisters. There are many who are our friends, our neighbors, and loved ones who need your grace and mercy, Lord. We reach out to you this morning to help those who need your help. Lord, we also have to realize it may be us, me, you, that you call on to be your hands and feet, to show them your power through us. But they see you, not us. Lord, when called, let us do this with you by our side. Again, they see you, not us. They see your glory, not ours. Just as a prodigal son, Lord, returned home, Help us to draw closer to you in all things in our life. Lord, help us to shed the weight of the world. It it places a, a great weight on our shoulders. You let us place that weight on your shoulders so that we can be free to serve you with glory and grace. Lord, there's many this morning right here, not only in our sanctuary, but in sanctuaries across the world that need to strengthen our relationship with you, Lord. Lord, help us to draw near to you. Lord, we ask you to bless our leaders. We ask you to bless our city, our state, our nation, our world, your world, that we can become centered upon you again. Lord, we take time now to lift up our own personal prayers to you this morning. Now we pray the prayer that you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 and 11 through 32. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bible if you have them with you. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine then took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went out, hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the paws that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off. And he went to his father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and he put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the robe, the best one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the fields, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He called out to one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And he replied, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got back He has has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your commands. Yet you've never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I started in ministry as a pastor, I uh, I was interested in everything the church was doing, you know, the larger church as well as the congregation I served, and and uh, you know, district superintendent asked me if I'd serve on this committee, and I said yes, and was on that committee, and then would you serve on this board, and yes, I would, and pretty soon I was spending all kinds of time, you know, serving on lots of committees and boards and everything, and, and that was great, I, you know, it was all good work, um, but whenever you know, I'd, I'd taken three years and went back to work at the seminary, and whenever I came back, um, 
It's been 10 years now. I spent a lot of time just trying to stay off of all of the committees and boards that I could for a long time. Uh, even, you know, the first several years I was pastor here, I uh, uh, was able to stay off a lot of those committees. And, uh, but in, in recent time, you know, I, uh, district superintendent, I, you know, he's asked me to serve here, there. So I was uh, serving on our district committee on ministry. And uh, uh, the, then we'd gotten a new district superintendent, and he called me back last year, and he said, uh, well, you know, we have one of our churches in the district that's wanting to do a building campaign, and I just wanted to know how you wanted to proceed. And, I, and I, I said, well, what do you mean? And uh, he said, well, you chair our district committee on building and locations. And uh, so, you know, and I said, well, if you're telling me I serve on it, I, I, you know, I'm, I'd been a member of the committee. If you're telling me I chair it, I'd, okay, I'll be happy to do that. But uh, I didn't know. And uh, so anyway, you know, lots of ways you get involved. And, um, but I, I serve on our district committee on ministry, so we meet with candidates who are considering, feel that they may be called to, to, to serve in ministry. We meet with local pastors who uh, are in various stages, some in seminary, some uh, preparing to go before the board of ordained ministry. And I got an email this week from uh, the chair of that committee, and uh, you know, there was concern about how we interview some of our our candidates and and so he he asked he said we've we've assigned several cop topics for conversation about how we do our our interviews in relationship to these issues and and so I would like you to lead our session uh, with a training on how we examine our candidates on the topic of sin and evil so my job is about you know how 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 we have a theology and understanding of sin and evil, and then how we interview our, our candidates for that. Um, and he says, you know, we believe that these are essential doctrines and um, that your expertise in this area will be of great help to the rest of the committee. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, my expertise in sin and evil. And uh, so I, you know, I ran into him at, on, at another meeting, and I just, I said, when did I take on this expertise that, you know, and, and from your opinion, you know, I'd like to know that, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be glad to lead the conversation. Well, sin and evil is the topic, sin and, and evil, and how, from my own expertise, uh, I can, can help enlighten the conversation. Um, was thinking about our scripture today, and everything's kind of been thought through in light of this topic that's been assigned to me. Uh, and, and so, I, I, you know, I guess I'm on the lookout for sin and evil in places. And, uh, and, and you, you see the scripture uh, of a family. Um, it's a fam. I mean, that's, I think that's the, the most important thing for us to think about as we start. It's, this is a story about a family. And... Um, and that's, that's essential for us to, to, to understand. Um, families come in all forms. They uh, uh, sometimes get along greatly. They sometimes uh, uh, have disputes with one another. Uh, this is a family that, um, that, that there seems to be a bit of conflict within. Um, whenever you have a story, you know, and there are two um, typically, they're going to be here and there, right? So here we have two sons, and this story falls in that way. Um, there's one, and then there's the other. And um, sometimes we, I think when that's the case, we often will allow ourselves to be defined in such polarized ways. Um, if, if, if you have two children, and one is this, Almost inherently, the other is going to choose that. Uh, we're not going to be the same. That would make it too easy for parents, right? Um, if one chooses one, then other will choose the opposite. And, um, and, and so these two brothers kind of find that in their life. Uh, the story is maybe as well known to us as any we know in Scripture. 
Uh, it's Jesus' story of what we call the prodigal son. The, the one who seeks after his own way, to find his own way in the world. Uh, context is an important thing. And, and the scripture gives us a bit of the context, doesn't it? Uh, we have the first three verses of the chapter, and then it skips a portion, and then it tells us this parable. The reason it skips the, those sections is not because it's unimportant, but, um, but because it's an awful lot. And so uh, what, what we have in Luke's gospel in this 15th chapter uh, are three stories that are told together. And they're all about something that's lost. Uh, the first one is, or there are two there, uh, that come before. One is about um, a man who has a hundred sheep, and one is lost. And so the shepherd leaves the 99 who are there to go and find the one, and brings it back and rejoices because it's been returned to the fold. The other is a story about a woman who has 10 coins, and she loses one of those coins. And because she's lost it, she uh, searches the whole house. She takes the cushions off the couch. She's looking down in between. She sweeps the floor. She pulls everything out until she finds the one coin. What's interesting in that case is she calls all her neighbors to come and celebrate because she found the coin that she had lost. Um, can't you imagine? I mean, surely it's not like today, but must be uh, somewhat analogous. Uh, throwing a party to celebrate, say you lost a $20 bill and you found your $20 bill and so you call all your friends and throw a party because you found it. Um, how much are you going to spend on the party? It's going to outpace the $20, isn't it? Um, it's a celebration. It's about a celebration of restoration. It's not about the value externally of the coin. It's not about the value externally of the sheep. It's about the internal value and relationship. It's about restoration. And this is the third of those stories that are all told together by Jesus. He tells them to a group of people who, uh, after seeing that the people who tend to come around Jesus are not the, the proper people. They're pretty messed up people. They're people whose lives are broken. They're people whose lives are not on track. They're people who've lost hope. They are people who... Uh, aren't the ones who are invited to the social parties. They're the ones who uh, never, they don't even know that those parties exist. I mean, they, they have, they're the ones who, whose lives are, are broken. And they see in Jesus someone who offers them enough hope that maybe my life might be put back together. Maybe if I'm around him enough, I can be the person that I think I was always made to be. Those are the folks who seem to be attracted to Jesus. And the people who Jesus seemed to uh, maybe more naturally be uh, a part of are folks whose lives are pretty together. Um, lives who, uh, you know, things, things go pretty well. And when they see Jesus leave them, in order to associate with those who are broken and lower class, they kind of grumble about it. Not because they don't like those people. It's just whenever one of your own chooses not to be with you and to go with someone else, um, it, we, we take that personally. And so Jesus moves away from the people he would have naturally always been with. I mean, we know Jesus, he said, it says, he, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He was the one who was always there. When any door, any time the church was open, he was there. Uh, and and, and that's, that's one group. And yet there's this other that Jesus reaches out to. And he chooses to move and associate with. And... For those whom he came from, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to accept. It's kind of hard to accept that he would rather be with them, maybe, than he would rather be with us. 
Um, and so Jesus tells the story. And he tells another story and another. It's only in Luke's gospel that these three accounts are told. Luke uh, makes sure that they are preserved so that we understand that that sometimes whenever our life is together, um, maybe it's about the mission of how Christ reaches out to someone whose life is maybe not so together as our own. Jesus says it in another place, um, who needs a physician when they're well? But when we're sick is when we need the physician. And so Jesus is available to those whose lives are broken. We have three basic characters in our story. The prodigal, the one who asks of dad, can I receive all my inheritance now? Just give it to me now and I'll just be on my way and I'll take care of it, you know, everything's gonna be good. Um, you know, that we can be in that place, can't we? Um, I know many of you have been on the walk to Emmaus. When you're on the walk, we have all those talks. Uh, one of those is on um, obstacles to grace is the title of the talk. Uh, it was, ironically, it was the first of the talks I was ever assigned to give as a pastor was on the obstacles to grace. Obstacles to grace primarily are about one thing, about sin. And in that talk, one of the things that's given for how we talk about what sin is, when you think of that three-letter word, S-I-N, that sin is like making the, the I in it capital. It's putting ourselves, me, I, into the middle of everything. So that the perspective is not held correctly. The perspective is that you can't spell sin without I, right? But... It's not about the I. It's not about me. It's about understanding my place in the perspective of the whole. And, and, and indeed, that's what the focus of, of sin is when we get off the mark, whenever we are not putting ourselves in the proper perspective of how life should be, that we get off track. And our life becomes focused in the wrong place. It can be focused upon us. That's what the prodigal has done. He's seen the relationship with his dad and he can only think about what he wants. He can only think about what he sees. And that's by nature um, what sin is. It's putting ourselves into the wrong perspective. Rather, when we see ourselves in the right perspective, then we're set free to be able to live life fully, but instead thinks it's all about himself. And we live in a world that maybe is more focused upon us than any other time. Uh, the customer is always right. Even if they're wrong, the customer is right, right? Um, so it all focuses upon us. We live in a world that if we sit back at home and just watch the commercials, we think it's all about making us uh, happy and satisfied in everything. Um, everything marketed to us, segmented for who we are. And, and we live in a world that, that will teach us that it's about ourselves. There is another way we miss the mark, and, and, and that's when we think too little of ourselves. If on the one hand we can think too highly of ourselves, maybe the other is that, that we think too lowly of ourselves. We don't realize that maybe God has a purpose and a mission for us. And, um, and so we don't give ourselves the proper place that we deserve. We disincentivize ourselves. We de-emphasize us. We play small. Maybe when God expects more of us, when God expects us to step up more fully. The thing is, when you're lost, whenever you're like the son who has lost it all, whenever you're like the sheep who, for one reason or another, got out of the community, whenever you're like the coin stuck in the corner underneath the couch, um, you're thankful for a God who's willing to go search us out, right? Right? 
you're thankful that when you're at that place that's lost, that God doesn't ever leave us alone, but that God will continue to work on us in our life. And that's the kind of father we have in God, one who will not let us go, who not, will not let us be lost, the son who wanders off and blows it all, uh, is welcomed home whenever he comes to himself. Sometimes it takes that. Sometimes it takes getting to the place where we've exhausted all of our ability to try to fix it uh, before we can ever turn and ask God to help us. Um, I, I, I think sometimes that self-sufficiency that we have leads us to that place. There's the other son then, the one who never left the father's side, was always faithful, the one who always thought that his purpose in life and the way that he was valued was by always being dependable, by always being there, by being able to be counted on, will always do the right thing, never have to worry. The minister at uh, the church we were at this past week at uh, Parkview Christian Church, um, his aunt and I went to school together. Uh, his grandfather uh, is a pastor of the church that was very nearby our home and uh, in Oklahoma City, and uh, he had, you know, kind of been around in that community a long, long time. Served there for for forty years as the the pastor at the at their home church. And uh, his aunt, Leanne, and I started school together in kindergarten. She's, my first crush was on Leanne. She's a beautiful young lady. And uh, I've known her my whole life long. Uh, our senior year, her dad, as you'd expect, gave the address for the, uh, the, the breakfast we had for all the seniors that were there. Happened to fall on Memorial Day weekend, and a good friend of mine, his family had a place that you follow, and uh, invited me to go with him that, that weekend, and so I did. Um, went with him. We skipped, the, we skipped the breakfast for all the seniors so we could go to the, the um, have a good time at the lake with his family. That was a good thing, never a bad thing to do. But Leanne's dad had decided that, you know, in his talk, he said, you know, talk about people who are reliable and can count on always. And he said, you know, like Scott Kennedy, ever since the first day he and Leanne were in school, y'all were in school together, you could always count on him to be there. Where's Scott? I wasn't there. I, I thought I was the guy who was always there. He thought I was the guy who was always there. Um... That was my identity, my role, and I wasn't there when I was called on. Um, you know, we think that sometimes we are that person um, and that our value is tied up in being that person who is reliable and can be counted upon. Um, but more important than that was that he was a son. More important than that he had always been with his dad, that he had always did everything that his father asked him to do. More important than any of that was that he was a son, and because he was a son, he was loved by his father. The other brother, it doesn't say he was, except in this occasion, that he uh, always squandered things away. Um, maybe that was the case, I don't know. But this, the other son, that wasn't his thing. It wasn't that he was known to always be reliable. But you know what? That wasn't the thing that defined him. The thing that defined him was that he was his father's son. And his father loved him despite that. No matter how wasteful, how arrogant, how even rude to his father, he was loved. No matter how good no matter how dependable, no matter how reliable, he was his father's son, and he was loved. It's kind of a fascinating story, isn't it? We, we really think about it being about the one who wanders off and blows it all, but I think this is really about a father. It's not about either of the sons, really. 
It's just that this father has such a generous love for his children. That God's love for us is bigger than we could ever understand. That, that we can't be so good as to earn it. We can't be so bad as to throw it away. God's love is just there. And, and we're going to do things to mess it up. And in just the same way that one brother goes out and blows it all, the other stands and refuses to come into his father's party. Both of them obstinate. Both of them think that the story's about them, right? Their sin for both of them is that they think it's about themselves. But it's really about their father. It's really about this generous love that God has for them and that they can't do anything to affect it. I mean, not one thing they do is going to change the love that the Father has for them. They can be so wonderful or they can be so messed up. And God just kind of sits back and says, oh, man, that's going to hurt. Or that's a good job. I love you both. But it's not about them. It's about the father. It says the father had two sons. It says that the father loved two sons. It says when the prodigal son starts coming back that the father runs off the porch to the prodigal. And it says when the older brother stands outside refusing to go in the party that the father goes out to him. Father goes to both of them. He doesn't wait for them to come. He goes to both of them to reach them where they are. Maybe it's just a really simple story to let us know that no matter where we go in our life, we can't go outside the love and breadth and reach of God for us. We may feel distant, but that doesn't change what God feels. We may feel, you know, I really don't need all this religious stuff. Doesn't change how God feels for us. God loves us, and maybe it's that simple. Maybe it is just as simple as that love is simple, and so we are to love. I don't think it makes it easy. I wish it did. It may be simple, but it's not easy. This father, in each, has his heart broken a bit. But it doesn't change his love. Maybe there's something for us to take from that for our lives. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing our hymn of response, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed.
You may be seated. We give thanks to God for the many ways that he has graced and blessed us in our lives. One of the ways that we share back with God in thanksgiving for what he's done is to share in a time of offering. The gifts that we now share go to support the ministry of the church, but more important than that, they are signs of our lives committed to God and to his service. So let us now take a moment to prepare ourselves for the morning offering.
would please remain standing as we declare our faith with our affirmation of faith, printed in the bulletin and on the screen. Let us, let us do this faith and this um, affirmation of faith together. I believe in God, who places joy in our souls, dancing in our toes, and songs in our hearts. I believe God wanted gladness to flow like a river, and so created a bountiful earth with plenty for all to share. I believe in Jesus, who turned water into wine, partied with the outcasts and sinners, and touched the broken so they could leap and dance. I believe Jesus opened the doors and set an extra place so we could all feast. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who prompts us to smile, who sends us invitations to come and die, who nudges us to openness and tenderness. I believe the Spirit is present every time we gather to break bread and is always urging us to live joyfully and walk hopefully. Forever live in the embrace of God and be a witness to the joy of new life. If you will remain standing, we're going to do our song of sending for those who trust.
If that doesn't get your feet moving, I don't know what will. <laughs> As we do our sending forth this morning. You are precious to God who loves and forgives. Go out to proclaim this good news to the world. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are ambassadors for Christ. God is making God's appeal through us. Look to God and let yourself shine, so your faces shall never be ashamed. Oh, taste and see that God is good. Have your own find their home in God. Amen.